Hey, I want to I wanna share a few things since we have a little bit of extra time today because of the Kids Fest. But last weekend, we were able to gather as our, our leadership team. And one of the things that we do there is to um, lay plans and to really pray through, trying to understand where God is at work, where God is leading us. And we have five prayer initiatives that we're inviting our entire church family to be a part of. And I've entitled it Praying Our Way Far- Forward. You know, we, we don't want to get ahead of God, and we've been very intentional about where we're sensing God might be leading. We want to take time and pray about that before we jump ahead of Him. And so here are our five prayer initiatives. Some of them you know. We've released a, a few of these. But here's number one, that God would lead us to win 50 souls for His kingdom. Well, that, that, that's fitting that it's number one because that is what we're about, making disciples for Jesus. We have seen where God has given us almost 40 last year, and so we just think, you know, as our church family has grown, that our goal ought to grow as well, and we just want to turn this community upside down for Jesus. And so we're praying that God will bless our efforts to win 50 souls. Here's number two, freedom through faith. You've been hearing a little bit about that. Miracle money is what we're talking about. This church has a mortgage. We don't want you to just dig in and sacrifice to pay it off unless you feel led to do that. But we've asked all of our church family to pray about a faith pledge that if God sends me money that I was not counting on, that in some way God provides a windfall in my life, I'll, I'll use that and I'll, I'll be a conduit for the blessing of God to pass through. And we have been uh, growing our mortgage payment for the last two months. I think this one we almost doubled, if I'm not mistaken, or just, just almost. And so you'll see it in your bulletin, but as you give those pledges, we're passing those on. We're adding them to our mortgage, and our prayer is that we're going to eliminate $100,000 of our mortgage this year. Uh, we just believe God can do that, and maybe even more than that. Here's number three, that God would lead us to be able to start a Pathfinder and Adventure Club. Our kids are they're a little bit skewed young, and they're growing, and it's time. It's time. But this takes a huge commitment. Pathfinders and Adventures isn't just what one person does. It takes an army of volunteers, as a lot of the other things that we do around here. And so we're praying that God will raise up leaders and, and people that will be a part of that ministry. Here's number four. We also believe that we have a need to minister to young adults. And so we want, uh, we want to be able to embrace these young people in a very meaningful way, not just to socialize, but to make disciples. And so we're praying that God will lead us to be able to launch a young adult ministry that will minister to those, well, unfortunately, they're a little bit younger than me. I'm not a young adult anymore. But uh, we believe that God will do that. And here's number five that we will develop plan for a church-wide mission trip. Uh, this, is, this is appropriate. If you've never been outside the United States to rub shoulders with people of other cultures, uh, it'll open your eyes, and you will come home forever changed. That's why I believe in short-term mission trips. That's why I, you know, I supported Jonathan and, and Laurie. I just believe that that's a life-changing experience. For people, if you've lived your whole life in this culture, you don't know what it's like. And when you go somewhere and you make yourself available for God to use in some way, I mean, who would have thought Laurie could preach an evangelistic meeting? But she did, and God used her. And God uses people like that all the time. And sometimes we have to go across the water to put ourselves in a place where we're willing to do that. And so it won't happen this year, but all of our plans will be laid. We'll either do it spring break next year or the summer because we want a lot of our young people to go. And this is going to take probably about $15,000 cash and then everybody paying their own way, but we know that God will open the door for that. A few other things I want to share with you. So those of you that uh, are connected to our conference through email probably got the email announcement last week, uh, Thursday or Friday, that Gary Gibbs has accepted a call to serve the Pennsylvania Conference. Gary's been not a part of our church family, but been very closely related to us. It was Gary that called me and asked if there any way I would be willing to come uh, to Chesapeake to pastor a church called Baltimore First. 
that was struggling in the wilderness, didn't even know where they were at, uh, and uh, he knew they needed to change their name and a few other things, and so he thought I might be the guy that would be willing to do that. So my wife and I, because of our relationship with Gary, was willing to come, and uh, he's been a close friend. You know, there are a number of people that really blessed me in my spiritual walk, and Gary's one of those. He loves the Lord. And because of that, God has tapped him to be the president of Pennsylvania Conference. And so we're going to be saying goodbye to him very soon. And I've told him I want him to spend a Sabbath with us before he goes because we want to bless him and we want to pray over him and uh, pray that God will use him in a powerful way. You know, the Seventh-day Adventist church is more than a church. It's a movement. And we jokingly say that as pastors, Jerry, you know, the Advent movement when everybody's moving around here and there. And, it, and it's, it's, it's painful sometimes to get close to people, to get close to pastors, and then they, they move on. But that's the way it is. This is not our home. And while I'm sad to see him go, I know the work of God will go forward because God's going to use him in that position of influence to lead many, many churches to embrace their mission and to win their communities for Christ. So we're thankful for that. One of the last things that Gary is going to do as part of our conference is a restore conference right here at Ellicott City. They're inviting, I haven't said too much about this, it's been in your bulletin, but on April, April 8, uh, our church is hosting this, uh, and there's going to be about 100 individuals that will descend on Ellicott City that day. And so we're going to need your help. Starting over the next few weeks, we're going to give you a list of things that you need to do. And uh, one of them is going to be bring food. Bring food. 100 visitors will show up. So what do you need to do? Bring food. But uh, we also just want you to be here because a lot of them are coming to try to discover well, what has happened here. Because we believe that all that's happened here over the last few years is reproducible. Because it's not about a person, it's not about a leadership team, but it's about what God has done. And if we can help people to embrace that and to begin to pray for their church and commit themselves to experience the blessing of God, I want to see a revival break out in every single church. I believe this with all my heart. As, as, not only as a pastor, but as a as a vice president for a couple conferences, I would stand before our constituency and say, I believe that it's God's will for every church to grow. The church is the body of Christ, and he is not dead. He is alive, and when the Spirit of God is there, there is life, and there is vigor, and there is reproduction that happens. And so I just believe that God is going to use this conference of uh, Restore on April 8 to be a blessing to many other churches. All right. Doing life together. This morning we read, anybody remember? Psalms chapter 13, 14, and 15. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Psalms chapter 13. As you're finding your way there, I want to take a moment and I want to pray because I believe that what we have from God's word today will be a real blessing if we receive it. And so we want to position ourselves and ask the Spirit of God to, to speak to us today. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we have. For the next half hour or so, as we open the word of God, we pray that you'd open our hearts. We believe there, that the word that we hold in our hands is powerful. It's sharp. It's, it, is, it is the means by which you have given to us to best know your will for our life, to best equip us for the life that is ahead of us, to be able to live in a way that will honor you and will be a blessing not only to us and to our families, but to our communities as well. Father, we want to live faithfully as devoted followers of Jesus. And I pray today as we read these song, this psalm, uh, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and teach us how we can be more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I gave my heart to the Lord at age 20, just a few years ago, it forever changed my life. I mean, it was the difference between night and day. One of the most significant changes that happened in my life was that uh, an overwhelming awareness 
of the presence of God in my life. I mean God and me were like this. We were more than this. We were like this. I mean, it just seemed as though his presence, like, like, like when I came to him, he did this. And I was just lost in, in his presence. I mean, I just, it was thick. It was just that way. Everything I did, everywhere I went, no matter what I did, when I opened the Word of God, I heard Him speaking to me. I could sense God whispering to me the mysteries of God through His Word. When I prayed, I felt as though God was leaning down and couldn't wait to hear my prayers. I knew when I got up off my knees that God had heard my prayers and that the answers were on the way. I just just had this overwhelming sense of the presence of God. And I experienced that for quite some time, at least a few weeks. And then something happened in my life that I suspect might have be happening in your life as well, and that is something changed. I mean, I went to bed one night, and it seemed like everything was fine, and when I woke up the next morning, it seemed as though something was lost. That bubbly feeling I had, and I had that, by the way. I mean, I had the whole emotional thing going on, and, and I, just, I just really sensed all those warm feelings. When I woke up that day, it was gone. When I went to work, it just seemed like I wasn't really in the presence of God the way that it was happening. I, I, when I opened the Word of God, it just, just, it just seemed like God wasn't saying anything to me anymore, and it seemed as though I was alone. Wow. You know, that, that's not a good thing for a new believer. That is not, it, it really brought me into a crisis situation because what I was led to believe, I knew that I hadn't done anything. It wasn't that I committed some great sin. It's just that something was missing and I began to think, well, God must have changed his mind about me. That maybe God did some more research on Bill and decided that something, you know, changed. And so I began to sense that maybe God had changed his mind about me. I didn't feel his acceptance. I wasn't overwhelmed with his love anymore. And I felt as, about as alone as I'd ever felt before. I went to work and a few days passed and there was another Christian lady in the payroll department. It's always good to have friends in the payroll department. And we were, you know, we were two Christians among a lot of other worldly people and occasionally we would slip away at lunch and we would, we would talk about the things of God and she had been tracking with me in my experience of giving my heart to the Lord and she cheered me on. She was such a blessing. She was so excited to see this little 20-year-old kid turn his life around and, and begin to live for Jesus. And in her own way, she affirmed me in every way. We went to lunch one day, and uh, she said, what's wrong? I, I just sense something, something is different about you. And I began to share with her what was going on in my life, that I, that I felt like I've lost the presence of God. You know, do I need to go get baptized again? Do I need to go back to the altar? What is going on? And she wrote down some Bible promises for me. She pointed me back to the Word of God. Because she knew that feelings sometimes are not true. That feelings don't drive who we are as people of God. And so she wrote down some scriptures. At the bottom of that, she drew a picture. And she drew a train. And the train had an engine. And the train had a caboose. Is that what you call a caboose? You know, the thing at the end. And she wrote... On that piece of paper, under all of those things, this engine and this caboose, under the engine she wrote, faith. And under the caboose, she wrote, feelings. She didn't say anything. She didn't preach the sermon, although it was a sermon in that illustration. I came to understand that faith is what drives us, not feelings. That feelings follow faith. You've heard me say that because it's forever etched in my mind. That I am not going to live by feelings, I'm going to live by faith. And sometimes faith are, are inconsistent. There's a dissonance between what we know and what we feel. I know too many people. Their whole Christian experience 
hangs on their feelings. So when they wake up in the morning and they're feeling spiritual, they open the Word of God. And they spend time with Him and they pray and they start the day off right. But if they wake up in the morning without those spiritual feelings, they don't open the Word of God. They don't feel like reading God's Word. They don't feel like praying. And so they allow the feelings to drive their actions. And friends, I want you to know that many of us fall into that trap. There are most of us go through that experience because when we are full of faith, we want to do spiritual things, don't we? We want to do the things that we know are right. We want to share our faith. We want to come to worship. We want to open the Word of God. We want to share with other people what's going on in our life. When we are feeling spiritual, we're doing great. But when we're not, we don't want to seem to do those things. And if you allow your feelings to drive what you do as a Christian, you're going to struggle. And I want to talk to you about that this morning because we live in a tough world. We live in a world that will do everything it can to steal your faith away. To steal away the joy and the peace and the, well, just the overwhelming feeling that God is with you. And so this morning I want to talk to you about that. As I said, we, we've, uh, oh, we've kind of come to uh, Psalm chapter 13, and we know that the, David, the writer of this psalm, had those experiences as well. David had a life that was a roller coaster. I mean, he had some really great times, and he had some really low times. And when he were in those low times, he recorded some of the psalms to help us through our low times as well. And so I want us to go there. It's Psalms chapter uh, 13. Listen to what he says in verses 1 and 2. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Does that sound like a man after God's own heart? You know who that sounds like? Look to your neighbor and say, you know what? That sounds like me. That's what it is. That's us. That's the way we get sometimes. We get overwhelmed with our own feelings of of aloneness and separation from God, and we cry out, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Now, maybe some of you have never felt this way. But I suspect most of you have. Most of you, when you read that, go, yep, I've been there. There have been times when I've poured my heart out to God, and he has not heard my prayer. There have been times when I've asked God to work in my relationship, or my job, or my family, and God has been silent. And I have felt the way that David has felt. What I'm saying to you is that there are going to be times in your life when God seems far away. He seems far away. But here's, what I, here's, here's the good news. Could there be any good news in this? There is. Because first of all, we know it's not true, but even if it is, even if we feel that way, I'm not denying that we feel this way. These are the very times when you have a greater opportunity to grow as a Christian. You know what I'm saying? It's in times when you feel as though God is separated from you, where you're going through this experience all alone, where everything is stripped away and it's just you, that you have the greatest potential to grow in your faith. Look, a long time ago they did this thing called biosphere. You guys remember that from the 80s? They had Biosphere 2 where they really tried to create a dome and this utopian. They created ecosystems within that. I mean, they created the oceans and the rainforest and all of this, and they tried to, as it were, create paradise there. And one of the things that they discovered, they were able to kind of recreate almost everything, but the one thing they didn't create were the storms that would often blow within the ecosystems that we have today. And one of the things that they discovered is that the trees that they planted were very weak. 
And they would grow to a certain height and they would literally fall over. And they couldn't understand. They had they created the perfect environment for every plant to, to flourish. And they realized that without the winds that blow on trees, they become weak. It's when the trees withstand the wind that the roots go deep, that the fibers in the tree become stronger. It is the winds and the strife that blow on plants sometimes that make them hardy. In case you didn't get it, you're the tree in the story. The trials, the strife that comes in your life is what makes you strong. Without it, you miss something, and God knows that. That's why the Bible never says that you're, you're going to be spared all these things, but he says instead, be thankful, because God is at work in you, because God is working through these various situations. James says, count it joy when you struggle in your faith, because James knows firsthand that when you go through persecution, when you go through trials, your faith has an opportunity to grow in powerful ways that it would not grow had you not gone through that experience. So today I want to take a closer look at Psalms 13 and, and let it teach us what to do when God seems far away. Three quick points, and then we'll be done. Here's number one. When God seems far away, assume God's presence and do what you know you should do. I could say it this way, and you've maybe heard me say this. You fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. When God seems far away, don't just do what you feel like doing. Do what you know you should do, even when the feelings are not there. Why? Because from our little picture, we learn that feelings follow faith. When you begin to do the things you know you should, the feelings will ultimately catch up. Notice what David says here in verse 5, Psalms 13, verse 5. But I have trusted in your mercy. The NIV says it this way, but I trust in your unfailing love. In the midst of that, in the midst of feeling abandoned, in the midst of thinking that God has forsaken him, he knows better, and he says, I'm still going to trust in your unfailing love. I know who you are, and who you are is inconsistent with what I am feeling. I love that. I love that about David, and I think David is saying the same thing to us. He says, you're going to go through times when you're going to feel certain things. When you do, continue to do what you know you should do. He's saying, don't let despair get the best of you. When you're feeling that way, choose to believe that God still loves you. Choose to believe that God is still with you. Choose to believe that God will still bless you. Choose to believe that he's watching over you. Choose to believe that God is taking care of you. You choose. You know, somebody said a long time ago, love isn't a feeling, it's a decision. And as a married man for over 30 years, I can testify to that. It is not a feeling. It is so much more than that. If love is only a feeling, then you're not going to make it very far in your relationships. I wake up in the morning and I choose to be loving. I choose to love the other person. I choose to believe that God is at work in my life even when I don't feel like it. And I do the things that do. There was a friend of mine, Jack was his name, he was a welder. It was back in Tulsa when I was doing pastoring there, and I was holding an evangelistic meeting, and Jack and his wife came to a meeting. And they had some spiritual background, but uh, they had wandered away, and God used our evangelistic seminar as a means to bring them back to recommit their life to Jesus. Not only did they commit their life to Jesus, but they saw the truth of the Bible that they should keep God's Ten Commandments not as a means of salvation, but because they love Jesus. And so they committed that they wanted to keep the seventh-day Sabbath. He was a welder, and he was part of a union shop. 
And the Sabbath was going to be a problem for him. He knew that. And as we talked about his experience at the end of the meeting, I asked him, I said, what do you want, Jack? And he says, I want to follow Jesus. I want to give my heart to him. I want to recommit my life to him. And I am going to do his will no matter what. I said, Jack, praise the Lord. I said, I think you're ready to be baptized. He said, I do too. And we baptized him. And it, and it took about two weeks for it, because he didn't normally work on Sabbath. It's just sometimes they required them to work. And sure enough, Jack decides to be preemptive. And so after a week or so, you know, he knows this is coming. He knows it's just a matter of time. So he goes to a supervisor, and he shares with his supervisor that he became a Christian. Not only had he become a Christian, he became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and that Sabbath was a day that he wanted to devote to God, and he did not want to work on that day. His supervisor said, Jack, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you've given your life to the Lord and all of that, but when one of us work, we all work. That's what they said. When one works, we all work. And he said, I can't give you the Sabbath off. And Jack was just beginning in his faith, but faith welled up in him, and he said, well, you know, I just, I just can't, I will not be able to work that day. And he says, well, if you don't work, you don't have a job. And so Jack was sharing this experience with me the next few nights, and we prayed about it. I didn't know how his faith was going to hold, but I knew he wanted to do what was right. And sure enough, Thursday, that following week, the supervisor walks out to the crew and says, we're running behind and we're going to have to work on Saturday. Jack looked into his eyes and the supervisor looked into him. Supervisor didn't budge an inch. And Jack left that day not knowing what was going to happen. He shows up at work on Friday thinking this might be his last day. He had committed that he was not going to work. He was going to honor God. But he didn't know at what cost. He, was, he needed this job. It, he was the main breadwinner. And so as he's going through the day, he's praying and hoping that God will change the supervisor's mind and they wouldn't have to work. Three o'clock that afternoon, the supervisor walks out and says, we'll see you guys at seven o'clock in the morning. Jack goes home. And on Sabbath morning, he came to church, not knowing what would happen. It was probably a long weekend for Jack. Monday morning came. He tells the story that he and his wife got up at 6 o'clock, and they sat around the breakfast table. And his wife looked at him and said, Jack, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to go to work. As far as I know, I still have a job. And then she says, do you want me to make your lunch? And they had to think about that. You know, you, you, when you show up to get fired, you know, what does it say when you bring your lunch? You're going to be around a while. And Jack said, yes, make my lunch. So Jack shows up. He sits out in the parking lot. He's getting ready to go in and face the music, and he kind of offers a prayer. He gets up and he walks out to where the people are gathering and he looks around and supervisors know where to be seen. Jack doesn't know what to do. So he works. He gets out of stuff and he starts welding and he starts working. And, and several hours pass and lunch comes. Supervisor is nowhere to be found and so Jack eats lunch with the guys. And as soon as lunch is over, he goes back to work. He works all day long and the supervisor never showed up. So he goes home. And his wife says, well, Jack, how did it go? Did you get fired? And he goes, well, no, I don't think so. I worked all day. I don't know if I'm going to get paid, but I worked all day. And she says, well, what are you going to do? And he says, I'm going to go back tomorrow. And so he shows up the next day. Sure enough, the supervisor's not there. He starts working. And all of a sudden, at lunchtime, they break, and they're all sitting around the table, and here comes the supervisor. Oh, man, Jack's heart just sinks. He is dreading this. He doesn't even want to look up. And the supervisor walks in, just kind of stops dead in his tracks, and he sees Jack, and Jack sees him, and they exchange this look. Jack said it was painful. Nothing was said. And so the supervisor just turned his head and walked on. 
So Jack goes back to work in the afternoon. Next day, he shows up to work. The next day, work day. I mean, he's thinking everything's fine. Then on Friday, the supervisor walks out to the crew and says, we're going to have to work on Saturday. I expect you all to be here, 7 a.m. And then he looks over at Jack and he says, except Jack. And then he walked away. <laughs> Took a lot of faith to get up that morning to go into work just to get fired. Especially taking your lunch with you, the nerve of the guy. You know what he did? He did what David teaches us to do. Do what you know is right, even when you don't know what God is up to. Even if you don't feel, or things don't seem to go your way. Jack continued to work for years for that company. He was the only person that got Saturdays off. So I want to I encourage you, trust in God's unfailing love. Listen to me, church. When you wake up on Sabbath morning and the devil whispers in your ear, oh, just sleep in. You know, Sabbath is a day of rest. You know how he does that. <laughs> oh, I'm going to rest on the Sabbath according to the commandment. No, when you don't feel like going to church, get up and go anyway. I mean, I, I bet you there are at least 50 people sitting here right now looking at me that have gone through that experience. Oh, I didn't want to go to church. I wasn't going to go to church. Something, somehow, something. I don't know how, but somehow I got out of bed. That's the Holy Spirit, by the way. Pushed you out of bed. You came to church, and you left here knowing why you came. Because God wanted you to come. So whether you feel like it or not, when you get up in the morning and you know there's a chapter in the Bible you're supposed to read that day of you're doing life together and you say, oh, I don't feel like it, get out your Bible and do what you know you should do. Don't wait for the feelings. Don't wait to feel your way to, as to grow as a Christian. Do it anyway. Here's number two. Cling to what you know is true. When God seems far away, cling to what you know is true. David says in verse 5, But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. He goes on to say in verse 6, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. When God seems far away, fall back on what you know is true. Oh, that has helped me so much. Think of all the things that you know are true about God and offer them up to God as a prayer. God, I may not feel like you're close to me right now, but I know you, never, you promised to never leave me or forsake me. Lord, I know you've made such a difference in my life. I can see my life has gone in a different direction. You have given me joy. You have provided for me. You have protected me. You have given me a family. You have given me a church family. You have given to me the Holy Spirit. Know what claim what you know is true. And when you do that, you will be strengthened. You will be reminded. I, I believe there's something very powerful about recounting the blessings of God. What are we told? We have nothing to fear for the future except as we forget how God has led us in our past, in our past dealings. Take time to remember what you know is true and how God has worked. You know, I think about that. When I feel far away from God, I think about what would my life be like had I not given my life to the Lord? Where would I be today? What would be going on in my life? What would my life really be like without Jesus? I can tell you, I can stand before you today that everything good in my life has happened because of Jesus. Everything. Everything. And if I had not given my life to him, there is no telling what would have become of me. And so I want to cling to what I know is true. And every time I think through these things, I overcome with gratitude and God's work in my life and my feelings begin to come into alignment with what I know is true. That's why praise is so important. And that takes me to number three. Keep singing praise to God. 
Look, when you go home, everybody feels like singing because we've just been in God's presence. We've just been worshiping. We've just been celebrating the fellowship of other believers and celebrating being here, hearing God's word and hearing the testimonies and other things. It's a wonderful, it's natural to sing in those times. But the Bible talks about there is a sacrifice of praise. And you know what that is? That is when you praise God when you don't feel like it. When nothing in your heart feels like you should be offering praise, you should do it anyway. You should keep singing praise to your God. Why is that? You've heard me say it. Love is not a feeling, and faith is not a feeling either. Faith is something you do. It doesn't mean there's not emotions attached to it sometimes, but if if your faith is only as strong as your feelings, you're going to fall more often than not. Faith is a decision. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 says this, By faith, Abraham obeyed the voice when he was called to go to the place where he would receive an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. You can't tell me that Abraham was overwhelmed with positive feelings. No, he heard the voice of God and he was willing to step out in faith, to walk in faith, not knowing what was the future. But God wasn't done with Abraham. Just a few chapters later at chapter 17, or excuse me, verse 17 in Hebrews 11, this is what it says, and by faith Abraham, when he tested him, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. What feelings do you think Abraham had that moment? I'll guarantee you his feelings were in direct contradiction to what faith was telling him to do he didn't feel like slaying his son faith brought him to that point and he was willing to allow his feelings to be subordinate to his faith and you and i are the same way David is talking about that experience in this psalm, that even though you feel like God has left you, that God is, even though the feelings are not there, continue to praise God for what he's done. And when you do that, your feelings will come into alignment with your faith. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. The next time you feel alone, The next time you feel like God has abandoned you. The next time you feel that God has not heard your prayer. And the very things that you're asking him for, he seems to be taking you in the opposite direction. When you sense that you are all alone and God is far away, take time to praise God. And you don't have to praise him for what he is doing because none of us would want to do that. You praise him for who he is. You praise him for what he has done. Look, we don't have to deny our feelings. We don't have to pretend that we are struggling with our faith. We don't have to pretend that we are not struggling with doubt and all the other things. The worst thing to do when you pray is to lie to God and act like everything is okay. God knows. Don't try to pretend it's not there but choose to focus on other things. Choose to continue to sing God's praise in your life, not for what you're going through now, but for what he's already done, for what he has already promised, for what God says he will bring to pass. Look, there are cycles in the Christian life. There are going to be some ups and there are going to be some downs. Don't let your life fall apart when you go down. Faith will sustain you in those down times. And I would suggest to you, if you do it right, you work it right, faith will grow you in those down times. And when you do, you're going to find that the highs are even higher because of the lows that you've experienced. So I hope you'll hide God's word in your heart. Will you do that? 
yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could say, boy, everything's going to be okay with you. And, and, and this and that. You know, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I'll tell you something happened to me this week. You know, it's just been a, it's been a terrible week for me. I don't like, I'm not a construction guy. I'm not Bob Vila. I hate this stuff, don't I, Joey? I mean, every time she comes in, I hate, I hate it. I don't like building things. And you know, when I arrived in this church and I looked around, I knew exactly what I was going to be doing for the next few years. I was going to be doing this and I was going to be doing that. And I was just, I was moaning and complaining on my way home from, you know, on my way home from work one day this week. And I, first of all, you've got to swear you to secrecy. What, what I'm about ready to say here stays here, okay? But I pull up not far from my house, and I'm just whining to God, you know, doing, doing what we do sometimes. And I rear-ended the lady in front of me. It goes from bad to worse. I mean a boom. And I immediately started letting the Lord have it. On top of all of what I've been through, Lord, now you caused me, you know, it's all his fault, it can't be mine. I don't even know how I hit him. In fact, I had to turn around and look to see and make sure there wasn't somebody that hit me from behind. But for the life of me, I cannot figure out how I ran into her rear end. And so she jumps out, and I go to my glove box. i got to get my stuff out. None of it's there. You know how it is. You don't have it there. And I get out, and I walk, and, and, I, and I'm, just, I'm ready for the worst. And I, as God is my witness, there is not a mark on her car. There is not a mark. I mean, I thumped the lady. I really did. I mean, it was pow. I cannot believe. I tell you what, I'm going to drive a Toyota all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a customer for life because I'm tell, I pounded her, and as I'm whining to God about my bad day, I thought, this is just icing on the cake. Now I've got to go home and tell my wife I hit somebody because we've both been accident-free for, you know, decades and we've been keeping our streak alive and all that. And we get out, and I'm getting, I'm, she, she's amazed. She said, I don't even see where you hit me. I said, I don't see it either. <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, give me your name. Give me the name of your insurance company. And if something happens, if my husband finds something, then I'll call you. I said, oh, he won't find anything. I don't, I don't think there's anything there. I, I even took a picture of it. I got a picture of it. I, took, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe what God had done. And you know what I did? As I got back in my car, you know what I did? I whined all the way home. <laughs> I needed this sermon. So thank you for allowing me to preach to me so I could learn what to do. But I know you're going to receive a blessing as well. But the next day I got up and I reminded myself of what God has done in my life in so many ways. He's been faithful.